Thank you, Stephen. Thank you so very much. Uh, we are ready to take questions. I'll listen to your views if there are any. So please don't be shy. Speak up. Yes, please. Sir, could you please give your opinion on, you said the study, well, like the study of Greek and Latin in a similar way in the Indian context would the study of Sanskrit, Urdu and Rabindranath Tagore's works constitute classics? But yeah, that's a, that's a difficult question for me. I, this I... is extremely exalting literature to train the mind into and take it to pastures which nobody has, no, which would be impossible without the study of these things. Right. So it's, it's, what it's, is your, your take on that? Uh, that's a very good question and it, it does, um, it invokes a lot of other questions as well. I'm, I'm not going to be able to answer uh, sophisticated questions on Indic literature, I'm afraid. I'm just, I'm not a specialist. I don't know enough about it. <clears throat> but one of the one of the evolutions of classics over the last 60 years um, has uh, the, the the site of classics has drifted eastward. So there's a very famous classicist in Oxford, Martin West, who wrote uh, a very lovely book called The Eastern Face of Mount Helicon. And the thrust of his argument is that when we think of Roman and Greek literature, what we're failing to take into account is the influence of cultures far to the east. So Jewish literature, uh, Persian literature, uh, and Indian literature. Um, and there's a big uh, interest now in trying to study world literatures more broadly together. So that there's a, a woman now in Oxford as well, Antonia Rupel, who teaches Latin and Greek and Sanskrit in parallel. Uh, mainly because knowing the different inflections of Indo-European languages and other languages, you have a better understanding of parallel literary um, development. Now, the Vedic texts are far, far older than Homer or any Greek literature. So in that sense, Indic literature ha has the crown. It is the oldest and uh, most, I mean, it's just enormous. The, 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 the sources are huge. Uh, when we think of Homer, Greek, the, the Iliad and the Odyssey, they're huge. for us they're enormous texts. They're 24 books each, something like 16,000 lines of poetry contained in one of them. I think when compared to the, the, the Vedas, I think Homer is a small footnote in size. So there's a lot of, de there's a lot of interest in the development and, and the connection of those those touching points really the, the, the difference between how we treat classics and how um, Indian scholars treat Vedic texts. Um, that's, all, that's all I can say on the matter, I'm afraid. I, I don't know enough. Uh, uh, Stephen, I had, uh, I, I, I had one uh, factual curiosity and yeah. then two brief questions. Sure. Uh, one is that you mentioned Oxford and Cambridge. They don't have departments of classics anymore. But I no, thought... No, no, sorry. Uh, sorry. Maybe I, I, I misspoke. Oxford and Cambridge still have classics departments. Oh, absolutely. But a lot of universities around them yeah. are, are ditching the term classics. Right. Yeah. So there's now Latin and Greek studies rather than the classics. Okay. Yeah. 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 So yeah, because, because Oxford uh, does offer a degree in classical studies. Yes. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So that. Uh, the, I have two questions. Once, uh, one is that uh, since we are talking about classics and they are Greek and Latin, uh, the study of classical antiquity, and in our minds, uh, not only in India, but I guess in large parts of the world, the idea of classics is very closely related to the idea of civilization, uh, especially Western civilization. Uh, and um, you see, there in, in, I, I'm a student of history, so there have been uh, critiques of the, and these classics are apparently, of course, the philosophical foundations of Western civilization. Uh, but the very idea of classical civilization, you know, Martin Barnall wrote this book called The Afroasiatic Origins of Black Athena. Black Athena, that's yeah, right, yeah. The, the Afroasiatic Origins of Classical Civilization and so on and so forth. And in large parts of the world, the idea of this, the, the civilizational exceptionalism of Western Europe is now being challenged mm. through ideas of global history, interconnectedness. So in, in large chunks of the Western world, in universities, uh, courses on West, the history of Western civilization from Renaissance to uh, whatever, 
are now being replaced by courses on world history. And how does that affect, you know, is there, uh, my question is, is there a way to teach students classical studies or the classics while also unlearning its linkages with this theory of exceptionalism of the Western civilization? Can you critically study uh, the classics? That, that's, that's one of the questions. The other question is that since you, since you said why the classics matter and you, you, you of course cannot read uh, Homer, you know, everything from Homer to, to um, uh, Kant and Descartes in, in their originals. But fun, at the end of the day, this is a question of the difference between reading works, any works, in their original language and reading these works in their translation. Uh, we can always read these things in translation and we do. Uh, we love uh, an author like Garcia Marquez because we read it's his translation by a man called Gregory Rabasa, whom Marquez thought he's a better writer than me. Uh, so, so you know, if you if you have uh, and every you know previously unknown and of course all major works in classical antiquity have been translated, not only in English but in many languages, including in Bengali, some of them. So why do classics matter? Why why does it matter to read them in the original? Is it is it something fundamentally important, or can we still do without it while reading the translations? Right. I'll start with the second question first, then I'll, I'll come back to the Black Athena question. I mean, that, that's a very difficult question. Um, you are right. I think Nietzsche very famously said that it's neither the best nor the worst quality of a book that it, it can be translated. Um, you are right. You can read Plato in translation. Uh, prose works lend themselves better to translation. Uh, in fact, a, a curious quirk of Greek, if you read Plato's Republic, the first chapter of it, if you translate from Greek into English, the Greek and English word order match up exactly. That's, that's quite a rare thing to, 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 to happen. But uh, poetry is a very different world. Uh, prose, the ideas matter. Uh, Plato's trying to convince you of an argument. He's trying to give you new ideas. Virgil or Homer, uh, half of the art is in the form and not necessarily the content. There's lots of passages of Homer that are just boring. But in the Greek, you can hear the music and the rhythm. Uh, and it's the same for music nowadays. I mean, if you were to take uh, English, English songwriters, Bob Dylan, and, and translate them into other languages, you will lose the whole expression of it. And I think that's why part, part of the reason is trying to learn the language to, to gain a sense of feeling how they would have heard it for themselves and the, the musical quality within the language, um, which is why, you know, when you re read Italian poetry, it always sounds much nicer than the English translation of it. That's the first thing. The second thing is that language is, an, uh, is a vehicle for thought. There are ideas that we can have in Greek that the, the Romans really couldn't. I think Cicero expresses a lot of frustration in his own language and, and its paucity. He had no words to express what Plato was saying. He couldn't just turn to his countrymen and say, well, read it in the Greek, because he couldn't. And so Cicero is often vaunted as the, the creator of Latin language simply because he needed to coin so many new words in Latin that simply didn't exist in order to express what Plato was expressing. And it's the same thing that I, I even at A level, when I'm teaching boys 15, 16, and 17, I'll give them some Latin to read, and I'll say, turn that into English. And they say, well, I know what it means but I don't know how to say it. And that's exactly the position you want them to be in. You want them to say, this is, this is, there's meaning in this sentence that I understand perfectly in that language, but I'm really struggling to put into my own. And you want, you want, to, you want them to feel where the fabric touches and where it's different. And that's sort of the value of learning different languages. The Black Athena question is, is, is very, uh, very topical. It continues to be a, a burning issue in classics. To what extent ought we, if at all, to elevate classics, uh, Western European classics, over any other? Um, and that's a value judgment. I, I, it's, it's impossible to say. Um, people will say, of course, that you can value all things or everything's relative, and I, I don't have an answer to that. I've, I find Plato, Aristotle, Virgil, Catullus interesting for me. And I think I like, to, I, I like the way that they, see, they can see the world and they express their thoughts. When Catullus is writing about you know, his love troubles with women, you know, as a, as a broken-hearted 21-year-old man, you read it and you think, actually, okay, the Romans aren't as different 
from, from me as they might seem. Uh, and then later on, when you get over that heartache, you can s start to read Virgil and you appreciate kind of what, how the Romans saw their world. And whether that's a superior art form or an inferior art form, I, I can't say, but it's one that I enjoy. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. It's a, it's a, it's a tough one. <laughs> Daniel, we give it to you. Mr. Siddham. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, Please, not a tough one. So, so you were uh, talking about how if less people study classics, um, how this could affect like language. Um, how, how, if like classics was mostly wiped out in the world, how would this affect language like today, as most students around the world study modern foreign language instead of you know like the ancient foreign language, more of the modern? Uh, that's, it's impossible to predict how languages will evolve in the future. There's a, a German poet, Goethe, who famously said that Shakespeare will one day no longer be read, just like Homer nowadays is, is no longer read. And I'm sure there'll be many authors nowadays who will be classics of their own, and in a thousand years, two thousand years in the future, you know, who's, who's to say whether they'll be read at all? As far as the, the development of language, if you forget what has happened before you, I think this is coming back to the Cicero quote I had, you, you read literature naively, you don't understand that there's a past behind you when you open and read this book, that this author that you're reading has also read other books, uh, where did he develop his ideas, there, there's no literature created out of a vacuum, literature is very much on a continuum, uh, thousands of influences and thousands of threads from various languages. Nietzsche would read books in French and uh, in German and in English, but he would forget what language he read them in. He would remember the ideas. Um, and so some phrases will stick with you, and particular expressions of a language might appear to you very beautiful. Um, other languages you find difficult and e read easier in, in translation. So. The influences are, again, manifold, it's impossible to predict, but the value of classics is just to give you a broader perspective in the literature that you're reading now and the influences that came before it, so you have a better critical view of how to understand that literature. It's like looking through a keyhole or actually opening the door. Thank you. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> uh, good evening, sir. Uh, thank you very much for presenting us the lecture on classics. Uh, before I throw my questions, uh, I want to point out three points. Okay, okay. first point is that uh, the university is curtailing the courses uh, of classic as a curriculum. This is the first point. Second point is that some theoreticians or historians say that uh, Homer won't be read in a in a particular time frame. And the third point is standing in 2019 the unrestful world that we are facing in front of ourselves. So what can be a quote-unquote smart model so that the classic can become a utility factor to this contemporary world? This is my question, sir. Well, I mean, classics has a lot to teach us about uh, c civility to each other and, and treating each other humanely. Uh, I mean, particularly today at the beginning, I mean, Mr. Dolan was talking about how debate uh, and the argument of ideas is how a society advances. If you simply shut out the other, uh, literature or the classics, and ignore them, or use them in an ignorant way because you haven't been trained to read them correctly, uh, that will lead to our downfall. A critical evaluation of historical sources so that uh, in a democratic society, more people are aware of issues within the understanding of these literatures will lead to a better understanding more broadly of, of politics and society and the appreciation of the other. And that was really my main point. The study of classics is about sympathetic intelligence. When you read the classics, you try to learn to understand how another person thinks and feels. Uh, and if more people took that on board, I think society would be in a better place, maybe not in a perfect place, but uh, I think certainly more generous to each other. So, sir, all along this, uh, the entity classic will remain as a subtle entity. Uh, sorry, I didn't quite catch the question. Uh, means, so all along, means it can't convey any direct utility. It, utility. There, it will always remain as a subtle factor for the mankind. Po possibly, yeah. It's, it's hard to say. I mean, these things come and you know, they, come, they flow and they ebb. Um, the utility of classics is there. People don't see the value of the utility, but I think it still is there. It, it's 
not you it's not useful in the sense that you're going to study the classics and go and get a job as a classicist but i think for a liberal minded individual who has a broader role in society than simply performing a function of employment the classics very much is the education of a free thinking person and that's, and that's its utility thank you sir yeah. The lady in the, the lady in the cream, sorry. Yes. I'm not asking a question. Good evening. I, I just want you to reiterate what you said about Popper. I think you mentioned Karl Popper. Yes. Yeah. yeah I'd yeah. like to ask you a little bit about Popper and what was his position on classics because we teach a lot of Popper in sociology and I would right. like to know a little bit about that. Okay. Well, I, in I the mean, A-levels, yes. We teach Popper. And yeah. Popper it, well, I mean, a lot of the philosophers, I mean, he was uh, early 20th century, so a lot, of the, a lot of the philosophers at the time were... Uh, classically trained. I mean, he had thoroughly read his, his Plato. Now, what he was referring to specifically is Plato's work of the Republic and the utopian ideal of that, which Popper accuses uh, uh, particularly of misinterpreting in his, in his works, which later on went to influence He was Hitler. critical of the classics, that's what you mean. Sir. Yes, yeah, he basically claims Plato influenced Hegel and Hegel, when writing on idealism, influenced Hitler to the extent that Plato's vision of a utopian society is one of totalitarian uh, structure. So the, the idea of the, the Republic is that there are, you know, the, the kind of the golden class individuals who are philosopher kings, who are perfectly educated in every aspect, mathematics, literature, and so forth, and they're the ruling class. And then everyone has a role in society to play, whether you be silver-souled and in the military, or bronze-souled and kind of common labor. And that was the vision. Now, Plato meant that as a moral metaphor. Yeah. So the golden tier of society was supposed to be our rational faculties, and the silver militaristic aspect of the city was supposed to be our appetites, and so forth. It was supposed to be a large metaphor, but when Hegel read Plato, he took, him, he, he took Plato at his word and started to write philosophy which encouraged you know, Hitler to kind of put these ideas into practice. But again, a critical education in the classics probably could have you know, helped. <laughs> in fact, Popper also points out the poverty of science and the hypothetical deductive method in a lot of ways. So uh, indeed, yeah, yeah. Popper's critical of the sciences as well. And, and yeah, the classicists tend to vaunt themselves, but again, it's axiomatic. So, yeah, there's, I mean, a, a lot of mathematicians, if you back them into a corner, they stop doing maths and they start doing philosophy. Dr. Kennedy, you've uh, used Cicero and quoted Cicero extensively to answer, or in your answer to this question. Mm. I was just wondering whether you'd like to invoke Eliot's tradition in the indi individual talent. Uh, so, sorry, uh, if I would invoke... T.S. Eliot's Tradition and the Individual Talent, the essay? I'm afraid I'm not familiar with it. Oh, oh really? Oh, shame on me, I'm afraid, yeah. <laughs> I, I think you would find it very useful. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> I haven't read much, Eliot, I'm afraid, sorry. Yes, three questions, yes. Hello. Uh, I, uh, since uh, somebody, uh, you referred to the Greek literature and somebody recently referred to the Indian classics, uh, I have just, just a point to make. There was a person called Dimitrios Galanos, a Greek person who, who came to Kolkata and he, in the nine, 18th or 19th century and he was a tutor to the Greek merchants in the city. But soon he relocated himself to Varanasi where he spent 40 years of his life and he translated most I mean, it's not most, lots of Sanskrit text into Greek. And both are classic languages, and he mastered the language of Sanskrit, which the vast majority of the population was not aware of. And his publications were, uh, his writings, handwritten, were published except for one only after his death, uh, posthumously. As a matter of, I uh, mean, his legacy continues because it only in 2016. There is Athens Center for Indian and Indo-Hellenic Studies was established in uh, Greece. Really, right? Yeah, and uh, it offers courses on Sanskrit, Hindi, and Indian philosophy. So a person who established a link between two classical languages of two cl of two continents. So thank that's you. Liz. That's very good to know. Thank you very much. That's, that's very interesting.
if uh, civilization today uh, was more familiar with uh, the classics do you think our economic political conditions would be far better than uh, it, like they are right now no <laughs> I'm, I, I don't know that's an impossible question to answer um, a whole nation filled with classicists I don't know it's hard to say um, yeah that's a good, that's a good question but uh, no, I, don't, I don't know I mean uh, the economy is influenced by so many factors, social, religious. Uh, I don't know if classics would be the, the solution, per se. Um, but it's nice to think that way. <laughs> well, it's happy to think that way, that it might happen. So read, read, and read. Yes, and that, that is true. That, that will solve a lot of problems. So that you can think well and vote correct. Um, I uh, would want to, you know, uh, I would just want to pick up a line of yours, wherein you're saying that we would... Uh, should read classics because they do change you into an empathetic individual, sympathetic, nuanced, and all those good things that come in with being an individual, with being a human being. Um, but yes, I do enjoy a lot of postmodernist literature, and my take is why not the study of postmodernism? And now we've delved into an age where postmodernism has already gone. We are into post-postmodernism. Okay, with the millennials right? coming in, so.